When you're on a self-improvement journey that includes cultivating healthy boundaries and healthy relationships, there might come a time when you have to ask yourself if your relationships are abusive. Sometimes that can lead to asking yourself, am I the abusive one? We can't fix what's wrong until we clearly identify it. So it's an important question to ask. When we take responsibility for creating change, we put ourselves in the driver's seat of our life and we can't do that if we avoid hard topics or hide behind shame. So today I'm with Karen Robinson of Heal Thrive Dream to talk about that. Karen is half of a mother-daughter company whose mission is to bring compassion, comfort, and healing to professional mothers recovering from childhood abuse. They created their podcast to offer education and inspiration to listeners. Karen, welcome to the show. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Thank you. So how did you become involved in trauma work and domestic violence? I, I grew up in a home where there was a lot of trauma and dysfunction. So we had an intimate experience with uh, trauma. Okay. And then as I grew up and became a social worker, I didn't necessarily want to serve trauma recovery experts exclusively. I, I wanted to help children is what I first started um, wanting to do. I then realized I didn't really care for play therapy very much. It, it was hard for me to play. It's always been really hard for me to play. Mm. But I really enjoyed helping adolescents and adults with their recovery plan. And I, it was just simply really good at it. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm doing this. Okay. So that's a long story short. Okay. So if you're like me, um, you've probably experienced that that sometimes people are in a situation where they don't know that it's abusive. Um, they just think it's normal because that it was normal for them. So how how what would you say to somebody to help them to know that oh this situation that I'm in is is dysfunctional? Yeah, that's like a really powerful question because what tends to happen is we gravitate to what we know. Yeah, we tend to follow patterns, you know, and also when we know a pattern of something, it it's familiar. It's the word comfortable is not quite right, but it sort of works. Like we, we feel comfortable because we know what to expect usually, even if that expectation is chaos. And so for when we're trying to be healthy, what, I, what I tell people that are worried about their relationships and counseling is you shouldn't feel unwanted and sad more when you are content that's that's a tip off right away right um you shouldn't feel less than you shouldn't feel unlovable in the relationship does that mean that every moment in a relationship is bliss no but you you need to feel respected and so that's I work a lot with people on like defining what a healthy relationship looks like and one of my favorite resources is, is it's a dumb title but it's called the Idiot's Guide to Healthy Relationships. And I joke with my clients, is like, yeah, I had to read it myself after multiple failed relationships. I had to make my own list of green flags, red flags, and yellow flags. So I could tell my brain, okay, if if he's on if who I'm dating is on this red flag list, I've got to say goodbye. I gotta get out. And so that's served me well in my therapy practice over the years. Okay. And now I have a healthy, healthy marriage. So. so if someone is thinking, okay, this doesn't feel good, then how do they know that they're the problem, that they're the abusive one? Mm -hmm. You know, you're the very first person that's asked me this question. Ah. So that it's, that's, it's interesting, right? Because that can happen if you're modeling what you know as well. and so. I think it's a, a complicated answer, yet simplistic, because oftentimes when someone is abusive in a relationship, it's because they are unhappy, sure. they are miserable, um, insecure, they feel like a failure. So if you feel any of that, 
then get help, you know? And if you notice that you feel that way and you're lashing out at others, then get help, you know? It's always easy to point at the other person and say what they did wrong. But if you are in constant chaos, dysfunction, conflict, look at yourself and, and ask, what is my part in this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because a conflict can happen without two people. Right, right. Yeah. When I worked in domestic violence, that so I worked in um, where people would come in to get protective orders. And it was mm -hmm. quite often that they were both players. But we have this label of, you know, victim and abuser. And it's not always that clean. I know. You're right. So are there any telltale signs? Like, a, a, are there any characteristics that, that somebody might have that um, that's kind of separates the healthy from the unhealthy? So characteristics for to be healthy in a relationship is when you respect yourself and you respect the person that you're with. If you don't respect the person that you're with, it's time to end it, you know, whether there's violence or not, you know, because you just, we all deserve to be in relationships where we thrive and not suffer. Mm -hmm. So if you're not thriving in your relationship, if you don't feel safe at home, if you don't feel respected or lovable, that's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Am I answering too simplistically? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm glad you said the word violence, though, because I think we know what that is. Um, but it can be abusive if there's not violence. So can you talk about that a little bit? Like what what might non-physical abuse look like? Yeah, the, the emotional piece, especially. It could be things like one person controlling all the money and not giving mm -hmm. the other partner access. Mm -hmm. You know, if your if your partnership means that one of you is going to stay home with the children, and I've seen it with both men and women. Like sometimes it's, it's the woman that's the red one, breadwinner, who controls the husband's access to finances. So it's not always about the gender roles, but if you are the primary breadwinner and your partner is home with the children and you're not respecting them or cutting them off financially so they can't pay a bill or get a haircut, you know, then that's unhealthy and not okay and can be considered abusive. If you um, don't allow someone to leave freely out of the home, like if you try to block them from leaving, that is also not okay. You, you can't control a person that way. Um, well, and I mean, there's exceptions, right? So an exception would be they've been drinking or drugging. Like you still don't want to hold them down or anything, but you, you leave that to the police to take care of instead mm -hmm. of you getting into a physical scuffle with them. So I always like to say there's exceptions to everything, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And other ways to be emotionally um, abusive is allowing the other partner to think that they're crazy when they're not. Mm -hmm. An example that's typical is one party is being unfaithful. The other partner thinks, well, the other partner is very suspicious, may not have a lot of evidence, but it just, just knows. And then the partner's like, oh, you're crazy. You're making things up. That's not happening. And then sure enough, later we find out it was happening. Yeah. So that's called gaslighting and that can be pretty abusive as well. So emotional is very layered and there's many different ways to be controlling, manipulative, mm -hmm. turning one party's um, children against the other party. Um, these children can be easily manipulated. And so stuff like that's all considered abuse. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up the part about the police, too. So when I don't know if this statistic is still true, but when I was in uh, domestic violence, the statistic was that a person would experience uh, some sort of violence seven times before they ever reported it. Um, why do you think that is? Because we all want to be thriving in our relationships. We, we No one gets married, I don't think with the plan to get divorced or for it not to work out. And it's even harder when there's children involved. You know, we want to keep our families together. So when you have children or 
shared assets. It gets really complicated. And we all just really crave to be wanted, to be loved, and to be healthy in our relationships. So we always hope it will get better, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, we're all, all of us that have been in healthy relationships are like, okay, if I just keep trying, or if I just do this, or I just do that, maybe it'll get better. And we know that in unhealthy relationships, it takes two people working on it to get better for it to work. Now, what can happen sometimes is one person starts and then the other one is watching and, and picks up on that modeling and they and they can get better. That's happened. But two people at some point have to be both in or it's just not going to be a healthy relationship. So do you think that going to the authorities, whatever that that is, so the police, Child Protective Services, whatever authority, uh, do you think that's a good thing? I think it can be necessary. I don't know if a good really fits here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned seven times, right? Seven yeah. incidents. Well, what if on the sixth incident, he, he or she chokes you? Yeah. You know? A lot of domestic violence escalates and escalates and escalates. And if you start getting choked, you may not survive that. There's there's a point of no return, you know, and waiting to seven times uh, to me is extremely dangerous. You know, um, I can't say for sure when is going to be the time that it's too late, right? I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think the authorities are just simply necessary. And we all know of, of situations where restraining orders have been in place and they have not been enough. For sure. One of my clients, I have two clients right now whose sisters were murdered in domestic violence situations. And one of them, her sister had gotten a restraining order that morning and it escalated and he killed her. I'm so glad you brought that up because that is a fact. And and sometimes calling the authorities is the thing that escalates. Uh, so what what should a person do uh, if if they're in a situation where they they want to go no contact? They want they really just want the violence to end. Um, what would your suggestion be? Yeah, it's it's a heavy question and a little more, more detailed. So some things to start with, and I'm not sure if I'll get them all is. Having a different place to stay at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, if this is an immediate thing, like don't have the, the same schedule or routine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I have been stalked before. And one of the things that the police said to me is you got to change up your routine, you know, do, do things at a different order. And so I would recommend that is having a different order. I would recommend um, connecting with the domestic violence um, advocate. So they can, you know, let you know uh, places to stay, you know, what to do legally. Um, I recommend having a strong support system and, you know, working that system. So I tend to think safe houses. I know that's not the right word for domestic, like domestic violence shelters. I know aren't all that in a bag of chip, but sometimes that's maybe like an undisclosed location may be the safest thing. Um, if you have children, having the school system involved, because that can escalate really quickly as well. Um, and the other thing I recommend is a ton of self-care, like making sure you're working on your rest, um, your nutrition, your hydration, you know, doing small walks and it, you know, in a different location, of course. Mm -hmm. Safety, safety, safety is is the the main thing I would recommend working on. Okay. So if somebody's out there listening to this and they're just like, okay, this is my life <laughs> and I I am the abuser, I'm the, I'm the perpetrator or the primary one, um, what would you recommend for them? Yeah, I, I do believe that people can change. I know a lot of times we hear, oh, people are set in their ways and they can't change. If you truly want to be better human and feel better about yourself and change those relationships to start thriving you just got to get help there's all kinds of groups for um, perpetrators of domestic violence there's individual therapy and learning how to love yourself if you learn how to do that you will stop that cycle 
you know, so it is possible. No one's less than to be an abuser. You you can change, but you got to take those steps yourself. Nobody else can heal you. You've got to do that work. So getting help is the main thing. Taking the courses, going to therapy. So when I was in a uh, court, the first time offenders in Virginia, I don't know if this is true everywhere, but they would typically get uh, anger management. And if you were good for two years, then it kind of just went away. And I know that the anger management was not helpful. So is there any kind of um, modality that that does work that you would recommend? It's a really good question, too. Yeah, yeah, the research in anger management, first of all, is very skewed because usually when you're when the person's angry, it's already too late to do an intervention. Like they've already lost their their loci of control. So I would recommend more things like cognitive behavioral therapy, like working on how you think mm-hmm. about yourself and about others. I would recommend DBT, working on you know your yeah. emotion regulation skills. Um, I would work on just psychoeducational stuff, like learning different techniques on a good day on how to handle yourself on a bad day. You know, here's my list, and you post it everywhere of what I'm going to do on a bad day where I feel crappy. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and have it you know, visible to see. But yeah, I agree that anger management is really not the solution, at least not by itself. Yeah. And it's skill the skills gotta be learned and practiced on days that you're not already in the red zone, as we say. Mm-hmm. And I think the family dynamics so the family that, that you come from and the family that you create makes a difference too. So if you're sitting here thinking, okay, this is me, I'm the abuser, I'm I'm really sincerely ready to make a change. And you start thinking about your kids. Are there any tips for what you can do with your kids to make sure that they don't end up in this situation too, either as the person who is the angry, scary one or the person who's running scared from someone else? Yeah. With kids, a lot of it is is talking to them in age development. So ways. So the older they get, you know, the more information you share. But, you know, just the basics are when we love someone, we don't hurt them ever, like not intentionally, like, you know, physically. Yes, it's, it's, we all hurt each other's feelings sometimes unintentionally, like in communication, but hitting hands on someone is not love. Like a hands on an environment way is not love, you know, so good touch, bad touch, not just in a sexual way, but in a, in a physical way and, and how to. Um, get children to respect themselves, their bodies, teaching children how to regulate their own emotions, you know? And so for children too, like if they're living in a family where there's violence, there's also support groups for that. I would recommend therapy for them as well, but lots and lots of open communication. And that doesn't mean, oh, you need to hate your mother or your father because they did X, Y, and Z. But this, this, you know, if, if a child says, why does daddy hit you or why does mommy do acts just giving a fact mm-hmm. you know and and say what also is true like say you know i i know you witness mom hit me however mom really loves you and she's decided to get help and this is what mom's doing if that's true mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Um, well, mom is not well right now. We're going to take a break from mom and hopefully mom will get help and we can work on our relationships again. You know, so not tearing the other person down is yeah. what I would recommend for kids, but being factual. So somebody's uh, listening and they're like, okay, today's the day I'm going to do this thing. Any tips for what they should look for in a helper? Yeah, but sometimes a good, good, good help is hard to get, right? We all have experienced that. So I, I recommend asking your support person, people in your life to help you with this as well. So some tips are Psychology Today has a therapist and support group loca- locator on it. And you can do searches by your zip code 
or if you can do virtual, you could do the whole state. Um, then you can also narrow people down by your insurance company and then by specialty. So there are therapists and support groups with the specialty of trauma or domestic violence. They can do searches that way. I think it's a great resource. If you go to an appointment and you feel disrespected by that provider, they're not hearing you, they're not supporting you or inspiring you. If you don't feel like they're trying to help you, then don't continue to go to that person. You just, you, you, you go on to the next one. Don't try to make your therapist a better therapist. That's probably not a great idea. So, yeah. 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 But just not giving up and, you know, and ask, ask your network, like, do you know a good therapist? Like, oh, I heard your, your cousin was going to therapy now. How are they liking their therapist? What is their specialty? So, you know, word of mouth also. So the more people in your support system that's look, looking out for you and looking for a therapist that can help as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know this is a passion of yours. And in fact, you even have a summit coming up uh, related to domestic violence. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. I'm super excited and nervous. My very first summit um, is scheduled for October 26th and 27th. It's a virtual summit. Our pillars for healing. Well, it, the title of the summit is called Peace After Healing, even if you don't believe it's possible. So the six pillars that we're looking at is how to heal emotionally, mentally, relationally. So there's a lot of talks on relationship dynamics, physically and energetically. Did I say them all? I'm going to count again. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens after you turn 50. <laughs> so emotionally, mentally, physically, oh, spiritually is what I forgot. Spiritually, relationally, and energetically. I work on six pillars because I feel like that's more holistic healing. Yeah. And so I have a few talks on each of those areas. Awesome. And so is this for, for it. yeah, yeah. So is this for professionals or is it for um, people who are struggling? Who, who's it for? Everybody's welcome to come that's experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we know about trauma is that despite the type you have, a lot of the symptoms are the same. For sure. Therefore, a lot of the modalities work. So if you have combat related trauma versus sexual assault, a lot of the treatment works the same. And it doesn't mean you're a cookie. I don't believe in cookie cutter mm -hmm. treatment. Like when you go to therapy, the therapist has to take consideration your needs, your learning style, you know, what what they think would really be helpful to you. And that how does question? Yes. Yes. And if somebody's interested in that, how would they find it? The summit? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the link is healthrivedream.com, mm -hmm. which is my website, healthrivedream.com forward slash finding hyphen peace hyphen after hyphen trauma hyphen summit. I don't know why we had to have all those hyphens or all that words. So I keep working with my team on shortening URLs, but they really <laughs> want you to know what you're signing up for. So it's healthrivedream.com forward slash, and then it's it's finding peace after trauma met with the patients in between the words. Awesome. Finding peace after trauma. Okay. Yes, that will be in the show notes. And I appreciate you being here so much and very good luck on the summit. Thank you so much. And I look forward to your time on the summit. Thanks. I'll see you there. Bye-bye. <laughs>